Blondin Professional Real Estate is a family-owned boutique-style brokerage with over 40 years' experience serving the counties that surround St. Louis. See how their approach to real estate will help you by visiting BlondinRealEstate.com. What happens when you put a career-focused woman with two kids trying to balance home and work life in a room with a microphone? Lots of laughter, tears, and great advice. I'm Jill Devine, and welcome to Two Kids and a Career. Okay, so back for part two with Shannon Bisher. She is a registered dietitian. Um, I get the title wrong. I know I will, but uh, specifically intuitive eating, correct? Yes, that is correct. Uh, Okay, so... We tackled a lot in part one. We tackled this diet culture that people are used to and setting yourself up for failure. And I want to continue that talk. Uh, One thing that we didn't really touch a lot upon, we touched a little bit about the scale. Uh And I told you, you know, adding all this new stuff into my life and eating better and doing some more exercises and not seeing the scale move has been defeating. And I know I'm not the only person that goes through that. And one of the things that you brought up in part one was when you became a dietitian, one of the classic things you did was make sure people weighed themselves and then you tracked what they ate. Should, and again, I know, I know I'm told, go by how your clothes fit. That's what it's about. I, I'm not there yet. I can't look yeah. in the mirror and see that. So are you saying or suggesting or giving advice that we shouldn't use a scale? Yeah. I mean, it's, that's, I think a part, and I say, yes, I think it's looking at where you're at. So if I see someone who's weighing every single day, I'm not going like to say, don't weigh yourself. Like they're not going to do that. But right. it would be looking at, could you weigh yourself less? And could we start weaning? Because a part is, and again, we're taught that the success is measured by your body becoming smaller. So therefore mm-hmm. your body being bigger is bad. It's your, right. and we are sent that message that a larger body is bad. It's not acceptable. So when we have, when we feel like our body is bigger, we have this message. And again, this is also looking at how stronger you might have that message and maybe those um, internal messaging, depending on how you were brought up and how, how was weight talked about, how was your body talked about, how was food talked about, those all leave imprints of how we have these little parts of us that show up. So that's where we might need that scale to be like, okay, yep, we're doing good. We're doing good. We got to keep going. To not have it feels like I have no control. I don't know what's Mm going to happen. And most of all, it's saying I can't trust myself. I can only go off of the external versus internal. That's the part that's the work in shifting. It's shifting. Wow, I feel so much better. I feel like I'm, I'm the way I'm eating. I feel better. I love the way that I'm moving my body. Those are two huge, significant well-being and health shifts. We're moving our body, you know, you're eating things that feel good. And I, of course, would like dig in that of looking at, but are you eating, like, do you feel like you're following a diet? Are you eating things that you want? Like that would be a separate little caveat. But if you feel like you're doing all these things that feel great, but they're not making the quote unquote difference that you want, that's the part we really have to look at. Because if you're doing things that make you feel good about you, why is that not enough? And right. more importantly, we're buying into weight stigma of our diet culture. Well, something you brought up in part one that just kind of hit me when you go for, well, anytime you go to the doctor, you get weight uh-huh. and, and, and then it's okay. Based on your height and your weight, your BMI is this. And, and I was thinking, well, is that something, I mean, I understand that that's what the doctors do, but when you said like, look at the blood work, right. you could have a tiny person who has the worst oh, cholesterol. Blood exactly. Right. Exactly. And it's remembering BMI is crap. BMI was created to pool a population of people, but it's an insurance marker. Like it's something that doctors can put as an insurance marker because what BMI, BMI only takes in height for weight. It doesn't take into account 
bone structure. It doesn't take into account muscle mass. If you just tend to be in a bigger body, like it doesn't take into account any of that. And the insurance mark, the way that BMI, when BMI was created, it was funded by an obesity task force. So overnight, people who were normal weight went to obese. So it's also looking at that, like how much the weight stigma is so much within the medical field and within mm-hmm. our, in that part of the culture. It's in, in doctors tend that there are great ones out there. So it's not all of them, but doctors tend to be the most weight stigmatizing profession. And they're the ones that will leave people reeling. Like I have clients that are like, I don't want to go to the doctor because I don't want to get weighed. I don't want my doctor right. to get my weight. Like they literally avoid taking care of their health because of fear of weight and the flip if someone is in a much bigger body, the doctor always brings it up. It's like, oh, my throat's sore. Well, that's because your weight's too high. Like it's always somehow it gets brought back up to their weight and they don't want to hear it because it's shamey. Oh, yuck. Mm-hmm. Yuck. So on that end, all I'll insert is that if that is a problem, you can deny being weighed. Like you, that is a medical right of yours to say, I don't okay. want to be weight. They can put the, the, the same weight you were last time, or you can tell them a weight. Like you do not have to be weighed. And that's the part where I would look at like, is that like your mental well being is worth preserving than being weighed. And so just know that that is a medical right that you can okay. do. Okay. That's good to know. All right. I say it all the time. I do not want my girls to have the self-esteem issues that I have when it comes to my body and my weight. I don't want them to have that. And I Mm -hmm. do a very good job. I try. And and my husband's on board with this too. Um, I actually told Shannon this before our recording, but I try to definitely use the words strong and healthy. I try not to, after I eat two cupcakes, listen to part one to hear that, (laughs) uh, say that I'm a pig. I try, yeah, fat should not be used. None of that. I try to always just talk about being strong and healthy. And the one thing that my husband understands now too, the other day we were playing around and the girls got out of the bath and he was tackling the younger one. And I had the older one and We were joking around about the younger one. He's like, look at those thighs. And he wasn't, I mean, he was just laughing. We were having fun. And I said, yeah, aren't they? All right. I think I said, what about them? And he said, they're strong. I said, yes, they are. Those are some strong thighs. And that's the way that we need to be. And Mm -hmm. I, and I understand past generations that's not always the case. Um, I know my mom is very hard on herself and I look at her and I'm like, you are so small, but we had a, a long talk not too long ago about what I want my girls to eat, what I don't want in the house because of all of this stuff that I'm seeing where, you know, you look at dairy and you look at this and you look at that. And like what you were talking about with obesity and who's paying what to, to be in the game. I just want strong, healthy girls Uh and they also need a strong, healthy mama. And Uh so I have to work on that. And that's where I need some help. Well, you're already, I mean, for sure, it's looking at what your language is at home. Um, how, you are talking about your body, how you are talking about food, how you are talking about other people's bodies. They're very aware. And the other part is, is you can do everything right at home and they're still going to be exposed to it because of our right. culture. Like my, right. my, so my oldest is a girl, she's 10. And I remember last year she made a comment about how her thighs were fat and I about fell over. I was like, mm. oh my God. My child, why is she saying this? I was freaking out because I have anything. We ne- we never talk about that. But all of our little friends, because yeah. of what they're exposed to, talk about it. So when I talk about body size with, with her, so like my conversation with her was, look, we all have different shapes and sizes. And our culture does send a message that if people are in a bigger body, it's bad. But my job is to teach you that it's not and that Everyone has fat on their body. Fat is not bad. We need fat to survive. Some people have more fat. Some people have less fat. 
Those that have more are not bad or less than than someone has less. It's like someone who has more hair or less hair, dark skin, light skin. Like it's 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 making it neutral, but it's teaching them that the stigma does exist. But what I am teaching you is that that's not how this rolls in this house. Like I am teaching you, everyone is the same. It doesn't matter how their body looks. We just take good care of our body to be healthy, which is moving our body, eating foods that are nutritious, foods that are delicious, foods that are nutritious and delicious. Like it's, mm-hmm. there's an ebb and flow. Like there's a permission of all foods, but we listen to our body. And that's this part when we look at childhood eating, that's, we don't ask our kids to listen. We don't ask our kids like, oh, how'd you feel after you had that? It's typically like, okay, two more bites and then right. you can have dessert, right? It's like, right. we all kind of fall into that. But that's this part of like, we're, if we're able to have a conversation about, we just take good care of our body and our body's going to be exactly how it's supposed to be, but it's not supposed to look like your friend. It's supposed to look like you because there's only one you. It's that affirming of that, as well as just watching the language with yourself, watching how you don't have, and it's not always even just language. It's also looking at all the nonverbals. So Mm. it, and I'll just use the, like, I'll use an extreme example of, of what you're, of the, of what you kind of gave as like with the cupcakes, if they see mommy upset, always eating cupcakes. And obviously not that you're doing that, but like, then they know like, oh yeah, when mom gets upset, she eats cupcakes. It's then it's this association with cupcakes, sadness go together. It's even these nonverbals that they're little sponges. They pick up on it. Ah. Oh, yes. I've more anxiety. <laughs> but oh, right. Thanks, the- Shannon. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's the beauty of the healing. And that's, you know, that's the beauty of our kids. A lot of times, and I, and I can't tell you how common it is. And I mean, that was a big shift as well with me. Like, it's doing the work. Today, I took the girls for a walk and I was uh, joking around with the oldest, Lou. And I said, because there's this one hill. I'm like, Lou, you might have to talk mommy through it. Tell her, tell me that I can do it. Tell me I can. And and she did. And we were laughing, but she has seen me do yoga. Sometimes she'll do some of the stuff with me. It, it just mm-hmm. kind of depends, but I, I see her observing. I think what, yep. what she's doing is she likes to observe first and then she'll play around with it. But one day I was doing yoga and she was sitting on the couch and she was playing on her tablet and she looked up and she said, mom, you're doing a great job. I'm proud of you. And I mean, it just, I knew right then I was doing the right thing. Yeah. I had her there by chance that she was watching. And I'm hoping the more she sees that, the more that she is going to want to do those kinds of things too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, it's all how you handle it. When you were saying that it was making me think on like a, on a body comment, like I've had, um, my son sometimes has said like, mom, is there another baby in your tummy? Like your tummy looks like there's a baby and it's just the neutralizing of, you know, that's how mommy's tummies look after I've had babies. Like, that's just how your tummy is. Like, it's not making it to be a bad thing, but more of a neutralizing thing. And the same with like her watching you exercise that it's this beautiful movement versus like, oh, isn't it great? Mommy's burning all these calories. It's more right. of just it's mom's moving. So it's, it's just how you show up to it. Well, and you, that was something I forgot to write down when you were talking about movement and the way it feels when I'm doing yoga and I can actually do all of the things that she is doing, the instructor I am watching, I feel so empowered and I feel so good, Uh but I will tell you, I think last week it got me, I I don't know what was happening. I said, I'm going to go in the bedroom and do the yoga. And I decided to do it in front of the the mirror. Mm-hmm. And that was a mistake. I was looking at every single yeah. angle and I'm like, why are you doing that? Why? You were practicing this really amazing exercise, but yet you're focused on what's in the mirror. And that, that was hard. That was really, really hard. Right. Cause you brought the external you, and this is the, this is why I love yoga. Yoga was, yoga is a, it's such a beautiful practice because it's truly a practice. It can be so internal, but the minute 
if, and, and you have to be in a really good place with yourself in order to bring that external and for it to be neutral. Mm-hmm. When you haven't done that, you are, po- you are completely, you come out of your body and you're just attack, 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 attack. I, it's totally. too hard not to. It's just, it's all these hooks that it's the hook. It grabs you. Well, because when I first embarked on this journey, um, after doing, uh, you know, a workout, like I said, it hasn't been, it's been a couple of years and doing this first workout, you know, of course I'm not in a mirror in front of a mirror. So that was good. And I could feel my face was red and I was like panting a little bit. And I walked out into the garage and my husband, Brian was out there working. And I said, that was a good workout. I feel great. And he was like, awesome. I said, I lost 20 pounds just on that workout. And he just started laughing, but I felt so good. Like I just felt good. Yeah. Well, right. And so then it would be looking at like, could you like, it's like the weight part is almost like attached to it. Like, it's like, I feel lighter because I did it. So could you just sit in I felt really good. And again, it's moving away from the scale. Like it doesn't matter how much weight I lost or what that, how this is going to impact my physical appearance. I feel amazing in my body right now. That is where it's, it's learning to sit in that. And it's the, and this is the hard part for a lot of people because of the way our society is it's sitting in stillness, which is really hard, which like on a Mm -hmm. yoga and like a lot of people have a hard time with yoga because it's too slow. It's not hard enough. It's not fast enough. It's learning to sit in your body and be comfortable with sitting with yourself. That's really difficult. So if yeah. I'm asking someone to like, could you just sit and just feel what it feels like, what feels good. And when we're looking at movement, every day is going to ebb and flow. Like some days you want to move more, some days you want to move less, but can you make it about the way your body is asking to be moved as far as like, do you have more energy or less energy or just what will feel good versus what's going to give me the results? What's going to be hard? What's going to make me lose weight? Those are all external. So I'm bringing it all in. I'm bringing it all internal of connecting in, connecting into what's my body asking. And so I flip that also to the food. What's my body asking for? Is it asking for more grain? Is it asking for more protein? Is it asking for more fat? Is it want a dessert to kind of seal the deal? I'm asking myself that because as I'm doing that and I'm responding, I'm going to slip up. I'm I'm not going to get it right every time, but there's still data in that. There's still information in that on both ends of the movement and both ends of the food. That's the intuitive nature. It's learning to trust what's already there, that internal wisdom that's already there. And men have this, but women, we've got it. We have that intuition that is just innately there. So it's, it's really reconnecting to that part, but we're taught and diet culture certainly does a great job telling us you can't trust yourself. Let buy my plan, do my meal plan, my exercise plan. Well, I was going to ask too, if, okay, okay, going back to the internal thing, Does a lot of it have to do, well, I know what we see on TV and here and all that stuff, but also do you attribute to the way that you were raised um, as as a big trigger, so to speak? I mean, I think it's a part. Okay. I don't think it's everything. I think it's a part of my story. Um, But I mean, culture, culture reinforced it. When you're talking about growing up in the 90s, you started having those uh, packaging, you know, no trans fat. I mean, yeah. this was all that stuff. Yeah. And so I have brought this up before. And, and again, this goes back to the conversation I had with my mom. My mom is a calorie counter. And I have actually opened her eyes to, to that a little bit more like, nah. So she, and this is what happened with everyone. Oh, this is only a hundred calories. Well, it's a hundred <laughs> calories full of, oh. And so she is very good with willpower. She can have that stuff in the house, but because of those ways of thinking, it was, you have this stuff in the house. It's just about control. You, you can have control. No, I, I am learning for me. I don't have that control. I don't, I no. (laughs) it's just enough because of the packaging of food. Right. Well, so that's where like, 
I would look at like the times that you eat these foods that you feel like you can't control around, control yourself around. I would look at several factors. One, how often do you let yourself have them? Two, when you eat them, do you tend to be really hungry? Like, do you kind of save up for it? Mm, okay. Those are two important factors because it can typically be like, oh, I know I'm going to have that. So I'm, I'm going to eat a lot less. Yes. Today, so that way yes. I can have it. Well, so the problem with that is that you're now in this physical setup because you're more in this primal hunger place. So the food is no longer just for the taste of it. It's now having to feed, feed your hunger. So I'm going to need more of it in order to do that. But then I'm not thinking about that. I'm thinking like, well, I got, I have zero willpower. I just ate all of that mm-hmm. versus if I'm, <clears throat> if I'm looking at wanting it and in wanting to stay in a kinder place with it, I'm going into it, not, not super hungry. So like, for example, if I'm going to say, and I'll just use the example of cupcakes since we talked about it. If I know <laughs> I have cupcakes at home and I'm like, well, I definitely want that for dessert. So I'm just going to eat a little bit of dinner. That way I can have as many cupcakes as I want. Right. Well, now the cupcakes are no longer just about kind of filling the cracks in. It's now it's nourish. It's part of my nourishment. It's part of my meal. So it's filling hunger. Cause now I'm hungry versus <clears throat> if I ate a meal and felt satisfied, maybe I wait 10 minutes, maybe I don't. And then I have the cupcake and I'm connected. And again, this is work. It's, it's practice. Okay. I'm, I'm more likely to eat maybe one cupcake, half a cupcake, a couple bites of a cupcake and be able to be, I'm done. This feels good because it's just about the taste of it. But we, most of the time there's an emotional load that's to these high charged, I can't control myself around it foods. And I was going to say, and maybe somebody listening feels the same way, like when you were saying um, basically the two things that you should think about and one about how often do you have them? And I started thinking, oh, well, pasta is a big one. I don't put it in the house a lot because I love the creamy tortellini kind of pasta heavy. So I don't want to have that, but you better believe when I have it, I eat the whole thing. So then I was going to the, well, okay, Shannon, if I had that in the house every single day, do you think that that's going to be good? But if I'm listening to you correctly, you're not necessarily saying that, but you're saying the work that you do when you have those things accessible and let's say you have a couple bites every night for dinner, you're going to learn basically how good it is at that moment and you aren't restricting it. Am I wording that right? Like you're not restricting it from your body to where you are going to eat a whole setting every time you eat it. Because you're no longer eating out of deprivation. When you're eating out of deprivation, it's, oh my gosh, I'm eating it all now and I'm not going to have it again. So you bet I'm going to eat all of it. If I have permission, so like, let's say you made the creamy tortellini and you were like, this week I'm having it every night for dinner, whether it's a side dish or a full dish, but it's what you're having every night. I can guarantee you how you feel on Monday is going to be a lot different than how you feel on Friday. Friday is going to be more than likely that's good. But like Monday was, this is amazing. It's going to feel different. I mean, they've done studies on this. They actually did a study on a college campus where they gave pizza every single day to college students for a month for free. And it was like the first week it was like, I don't know, like almost the whole, whole college campus was there. But as the month went down, month went, went down, it just dwindled smaller and smaller and smaller because it becomes not that big of a deal anymore. But we right. have to have the permission. The permission is such a key part of healing your relationship with food, but it's the scariest part for most, for most people. So that's where it's like starting at a lower charge food that maybe doesn't feel so scary and experimenting like, what's that like? And then mm-hmm. you kind of move up to the next one. You can do it with a handful of foods. Like you don't, some people don't even have to hit their highest trigger food, but it's, that's this part of looking at like, and just to stay curious. That's the key, key part. Just stay curious. Like our, our tendency is to want to like just judge and judge and critique like, Oh, you ate too much there or you had way too much here, but just to be curious with like, okay, I probably could have stopped two bites ago. So tomorrow night, I'm just going to make sure I'm a little bit more dialed in. Like we bring more curiosity because it's a kinder emotion than judgment. And I just try to stay really compassionate with 
that part that's like, oh my God, I get to have cheese tortellini tonight. Like it's excited. So it, it, you know, usually it's like a younger part of you that's like, yes, we get to have it. And it's just helping that permission helps to kind of neutralize it. But just to stay curious with like, how does this feel? Does it feel different Tuesday? Does it feel different Wednesday? What do I notice? But the more we're open to that curiosity, we're collecting the data of it versus those situations. It's like, I'm just eating it to eat it because I get to have it. I'm not even dialed into that. I wrote down, uh, be more dialed in. Like that, mm-hmm. that's what resonated. Yeah, that's that's big. Yep. Okay. So I think that you need to get your information out there for my <laughs> listener. I also, you know, think that if you're up for it, when things calm down, when we can actually meet in person, I think it would be pretty cool if we could have someone else come and tell their story and tackle what they have. Yeah. Because I think I obviously have my stuff. I put it all, I didn't put it all out there because we're running out of time, but (laughs) I think that there might be somebody else that might have a little bit of a different way of approach with food. So yeah, that would be great if you're open to that. Perfect. I'm writing that down. It's on the record, but in the meantime, tell my listeners how they can get a hold of you. And if you don't have a pen or paper handy at this moment, it will be in the show notes at jilldevine.com. But if you do write it down, where yeah. can we reach you? So um, you can go on my website, which is Hayes Nutrition, H-A-Y-E-S nutrition.com. Um, I'm on Facebook under Hayes Nutrition and Instagram at Shannon Fisher. Will you spell your last name? Because it's not how yeah. it's, uh, no, it's it sounds. Yeah, it's <laughs> C-H-E-R. Okay, so HayesNutrition.com, H-A-Y-E-S. And that's also on Facebook. And Instagram, you said it's Shannon Fisher. Yes. At Shannon. Okay, perfect. Yep. Anything else you want to add before you go? I mean, this has been really insightful because in part one, I mean, I know we're talking about food, but I said it was all about the food, but really, and I should, you know, you should know it's the brain too, but it's not just about the food. So that was really inspiring to me, but anything else that you want to say until next time when I have you on? Yeah, just to stay, I mean, it's, it's, it's truly like, it's, it's a, it's a journey to change it and it's, you know, and it's hard and it can be scary and just to trust in your timing when you're ready to look at it in a different way that feels um, that you feel ready to do that. It's and and to do the deeper dive because otherwise you kind of stay on the same diet train until you're ready to really find that healing, but just to stay kind and stay curious. I love that. Stay kind and stay curious. Thank you, Shannon. You're so welcome. Thank you for joining me for today's episode. Make sure you subscribe rate. And if you're feeling really generous, write me a review and don't forget to join me next week for a new episode of two kids and a career.